It's a great privilege for me to be worshiping with you all this morning. I'm grateful to Michael for the invitation to preach here today. Some of you might be new to the United Methodist Church and you're wondering, well, what is a bishop anyway? When explaining that role, I used the illustration from the game of chess. Uh, as a bishop, I move diagonally long distances. Um, <laughs> That's because the Memorial Drive and all other United Methodist churches in this part of the state are part of the Texas Conference, and I'm the team leader for that conference, so that I'm related to churches in Texarkana, College Station, Houston, as well as over to Beaumont and Orange, so that I do travel around quite a bit. I hear reports about how churches are doing, and I want to say thank you to Memorial Drive for two reasons. First, the last time I was here at the Journey was the week after after Hurricane Harvey hit, the Saturday after, you all were doing an amazing amount of work to respond to that disaster. You had a lot of bottled water here and the people at Beaumont had almost none. So I loaded up a trailer and pickup truck and took it from you all down to share with our brothers and sisters in the Beaumont area. So thank you for everything that you've done and how are doing in responding to Hurricane Harvey. The second thing is to say thank you for supporting Linda Jenkins, your parish nurse. You are already involved in health ministry so that to some extent I'm preaching to the choir today, but I hope I help you go deeper in understanding why the church is involved in health ministry. Would you listen now to the word of God from the gospel according to Luke in the fifth chapter beginning with the 17th verse. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place, for we trust your promise that wherever two or more are gathered, there you will be also. And yet, God, sometimes we don't get it. So we ask, open our eyes that we might see you. Open our ears that we might truly hear your word. And then, God, strengthen our hands and feet that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have seen remarkable things, especially in the healthcare field. The year I was born was the year they performed the first kidney transplant. But now, Houston Methodist Hospital does 200 of them every year. And just last year, they did six transplants in one day from one donor to the next, to the next, to the next. Twelve people involved in this amazing surgery and six people went home with somebody else's kidney inside their body. It was 1968 when Michael DeBakey did the first heart transplant in Houston. And since then, Houston Methodist has done over 700 of them. Wouldn't it be remarkable if you were the recipient of a kidney or a heart and walked around knowing that your life really depended upon a donation from somebody else and the skill of medical professionals in performing a transplant on you? I have seen remarkable things in my lifetime in the healthcare field. It was a remarkable thing that Jesus healed the paralyzed man. He astonished everybody who was there. He astonished them, first of all, by speaking what, well, the Pharisees thought was blasphemy. Your sins are forgiven, he said. When that guy was lowered down through the roof to be in front of him, 
Jesus recognized what his real problem was. He needed reconciliation with God. He needed reconciliation with the community. His primary problem was he needed forgiveness, and Jesus gave it to him. But that challenged the religious leaders of his day who thought, wait a minute, who is this Jesus guy and what's he doing talking about forgiveness? That's when Jesus said, oh, you really want to say something hard? Okay, young man, take up your mat and walk. The paralysis was gone, he was healed, and he left praising God. It was truly a remarkable event. These stories of Jesus healing, they show up on 17 different occasions in the Gospels, are times when Jesus demonstrated his power and his identity as the Son of God, but he also demonstrated what it truly means to love people and to approach them holistically. These healing stories actually have a number of of interesting connections. You've seen the one here where he connected up forgiveness with physical healing. There was another occasion when there was a blind man near Jericho who said, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want to see. What did Jesus say? Your faith has saved you. Hello? Did he ask for salvation? No, he asked for healing. But in the Bible, the connection between salvation and being able to see is so tight. It's actually the same word, sozo in the Greek, that sometimes gets translated as healed and sometimes gets translated as saved. This basic approach to how Jesus approached people really gave a lot of impetus to Christians down through the centuries and especially to the ministry of John Wesley. The years I was a professor at Perkins School of Theology, I taught students about Methodist history. And one of the things I wanted to get across to them was the way in which John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was concerned about the whole person. Yes, he was primarily a preacher and an evangelist. People were leaving the farms and moving to the cities. Sound familiar? And when they relocated, they were losing their connection to God, losing their connection to the church. And so John Wesley would go out into the fields to places where there wasn't a church started yet, and he would start a new Methodist society so that people would come to know Christ and experience saving power and a relationship with Christ as Lord and Savior. But Wesley didn't stop there. As he got acquainted with these people, he not only helped them form small groups and and learn to care for each other, he recognized that some of them had bigger problems. A lot of the women were poor and didn't have any means of employment, and so Wesley provided classes that would teach them a trade and help them to earn a living. He also knew that in their poverty, well, they had trouble getting medical care. You see, in the 1700s, doctors didn't make house calls. Sound familiar? So Wesley set up the first free medical dispensary in the history of London. He also began gathering folk remedies and published them in a book called Primitive Physic. This book has a number of folk remedies that he'd been given by people who said, this will heal this disease. And so by each disease, he lists ones that he thought might help. And if he had actually tried it, he put a special mark to say tried right beside it. Some of them were really smart. He strongly recommended uh, exercise and fresh air. He also suggested if you're drinking too much coffee, it might be bad for you. Lay off the caffeine a little bit. Some of his recipes weren't quite good, though. The recipe for baldness is to rub an onion on your head. I do not recommend that one. (laughs) This was also a period of time when people were learning what electricity really was. You've heard the story, perhaps, of Ben Franklin with the key on a kite and discovering that lightning is really a form of electricity. They first invented batteries during the 1700s as well. Well, Wesley got hold of a static electricity machine. You crank it and it creates a static electrical charge. And he thought if you electrified a part of your body that was hurt, it would help in the healing process. You can go to Wesley's chapel in London and see the actual machine still in the museum there today. Well, when I saw that, I thought, yeah, that's like the onion on the head thing. It's a really dumb idea, right? Then in 1997, I had knee surgery. 
in the therapy that they sent me to, I had to do the bicycle to get the knee working again. And after riding the bicycle for 10 minutes, they sent me to a table. And what did they do? Attached an electrical generator to electrify my knee. Wesley was ahead of his time, experimenting with whatever would help real people. That's why in the Methodist Church, since Wesley's day, we have been engaged with taking high-quality health care to people who needed it. You all here as part of the journey look at this wooden backdrop to the preacher every week. You might know the story of how that wood came from Maua, Kenya, where there's a Methodist hospital that Memorial Drive has supported and been a part of. We have founded hospitals all over the world because we know that not only do people need the gospel, they need physical healing as well. It's that understanding of wholeness that's really important. Now, I know that there are some people who so emphasize the religious part of things that they think, well, if you pray, you don't need the doctor. That's not the Methodist way. We do pray, but we also believe in going to the doctor. On the other hand, there are people over here who think, well, as long as you're dealing with a physical body, you don't need prayer or anything else. I've been talking to a lot of medical leaders in America for the last 15 years, and one of the things that the brightest people are talking about is the holistic approach to medicine. They call it, in some circles, the social determinants of health. Yes, we've made remarkable strides at medical procedures that take care of people's bodies, but we also know that if somebody doesn't have good nutrition, a good community, if they don't have the kind of social support that will provide for the healing process, the outcomes aren't nearly as good. While the church has a job to provide care like we do at Methodist Hospital in Houston, we also have a job to focus on the spiritual sides of the healing process. Part of that is forgiveness. We know that when people have broken relationships, when they're suffering from guilt, when they're engaging in sinful behaviors, when they're broken in their relationships with their family, that the healing process doesn't work as well. When I talk to chaplains at Methodist Hospital, sometimes in their ministry with the patients who are there, they're hearing the stories of how these people who might be suffering from some disease are also wrestling with an emotional or spiritual problem, and the chaplain in their prayer life is helping people find that forgiveness that will help the healing process go forward. Secondly, the church has an obligation to teach faith to people. Faithful people who are participating in a church as a group are healthier than people who don't have faith. I learned this especially in the years I was a pastor when there was an Alcoholics Anonymous group meeting in the basement of my church. I am not an alcoholic, but I learned a lot from the people who are. And they talked about the recovery process and acknowledged that the beginning part of it is to acknowledge that you need a higher power to help you cope with your addiction. That's true of addiction to alcohol or drugs, but it's also true of our patterns of behavior when we can't break out of the unhealthy things we do. We need God's power to give us the strength and direction to move in the direction that we're supposed to move. Not only is the spiritual role of healing to talk about forgiveness and faith, it's also to talk about friends. That's the point of the story that Lauren just explained to the children so well. It was the guy's friends who brought him to Jesus. And when the crowds prevented them, they in fact went up on the roof. You might know that in the Middle East, those roofs are flat. Frequently, there's a staircase opening or some other way to get up on top. And so it wasn't that hard to lower the man down and put him right in front of Jesus. It was the faith of the friends that convinced Jesus to heal him. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has led you to forgiveness. But it was the role of the friends in doing that. That's my challenge to you all as Memorial Drive United Methodist Church. Who are the people who should be your friends? The people that you have in your sphere of influence, the people that you could be praying for, the people that you could bring to Jesus to help in that healing process. 
I'm so grateful that we have excellent hospitals in our city, but I also know that there are people who aren't able to access that medical care. How do we as a church reach out to those people? I'm also aware that even if you get world-class medical care in a hospital, when you go home, how does that healing process continue, and what's the role of the church in being a friend to somebody else? Far too often, Christians have made a mistake of separating physical from spiritual. I led mission trips all the years I was a pastor. One year, we took a group of middle school boys to South Texas in July. This was a dumb time. I should have gone in October. But there we were in July, putting a roof on a woman's house in the great heat. But I made a deep mistake as a pastor. While we reshingled her house, and I hope it was, became dry as a result of our labors, we never once went downstairs and talked to the woman. We never introduced ourselves. We never asked her, how is it with your soul? Part of the mistake that we Christians sometimes make is thinking that we're dealing with a bodiless soul or a soulless body. And in fact, loving our neighbor means loving them holistically, of caring not only for their spiritual and emotional life, but also caring for their physical needs as well. That's what the point to church's ministry of healing is all about. It's not only taking care of people's bodies, but it's offering the kind of friendship and forgiveness and the spiritual power of Christ that makes a difference. Sometimes we Christians have sort of put the healing process only on the medical side as if people were soulless bodies. Oh, just get the doctor to take care of it and it will all work. The medical professionals I know understand that there's a spiritual side to healing as well. As a pastor, and even today as a bishop, when I visit people in the hospital, I pray for them because I know that God answers prayers. God doesn't always answer them the way I want it, but I know that my prayers are heard and that in that healing process, that helps to make a difference. The best medical professionals I know recognize that there's more to it than just the skill that they bring and the physical realities that they deal with. I remember so well having gathered to pray with a man before his surgery, waiting in the, with the family downstairs in the waiting room. It was a very difficult and dangerous surgery. The guy made it. And the doctor came down and told us, he said, this was one of the most difficult cases I've ever seen. He's gonna be okay. And I have to say, we got some help from God on this one. Prayer makes a difference. It doesn't always mean we get the answer we want, but we are part of the healing process because as we participate with medical professionals and spiritual leaders, and as we become the kinds of friends that help in that process, we will truly see some remarkable things. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit and allowing us to be part of the healing process. We thank you for medical professionals and the skill they bring. God, we ask that you would show us how we truly might be friends to those who are in need. Help us to offer our time, our talents, and our ability to be a part of the healing process so that our church might be a place where indeed people find wholeness and health. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen.